How do you measure the wealth of a country? For many, gross domestic product is the first and perhaps only measurement that comes to mind. GDP measures the monetary value of the goods and services a country produces, but it doesn't provide information on a country's wealth or how sustainable development will be in the long term. To do that, we need to consider all of a country's assets, the ones used to produce those goods and services in the first place. So what assets ought to be considered? Let's explore some of them. First, the natural capital, like forests, agricultural lands, fisheries, and minerals. Also the human-made or produced capital, buildings, roads, machinery, and such. And of course, the skills and experience of the population, a country's human capital. Taking stock of a country's assets can help determine whether or not growth is sustainable. Exploiting natural resources may look like economic growth today, but what about the future? Forest degradation, air pollution, overfishing, and more deplete wealth and threaten future prosperity. Overdependence on certain non-renewable resources, especially fossil fuels, also poses risks. Steps to increase future prosperity are possible, however. Protecting and investing in renewable natural capital is imperative, particularly in the face of climate change. For example, consider how storms are increasing in frequency and intensity, all while coastlines are further developed. What can be done to protect these coastal assets? One innovative approach, replant mangroves, a renewable natural resource. Mangroves are becoming even more valuable because of the protection they offer coastlines. Investments in replanting and protecting mangroves, especially where they are protecting other assets, can safeguard future wealth. Natural and produced capital aren't the only types of resources in need of protection, though. Did you know that in most countries, human capital represents the greatest fraction of wealth? The global COVID-19 pandemic shows just how at risk human capital and livelihoods can be and reinforce the need to address ongoing issues like gender gaps and the health impacts of air pollution. The World Bank's Changing Wealth of Nations 2021 provides the most comprehensive data to date with full accounts of wealth for 146 countries. Through wealth accounting, decision makers can promote future economic viability and growth with policies that promote sustainable use and diversification of assets. Look ahead to the future with an eye on climate change and other risks, and continually invest in a nation's greatest resource, its people. Hello, and greetings from COP26 in Glasgow. I'm Elizabeth Mealy, Communications Manager for Sustainable Development at the World Bank. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event, The Value of Nature to People and Planet. This is especially timely on the eve of Nature Day at COP here, where many of the major discussions will focus on the connections between the drivers of nature loss and climate change. As you saw in our opening video, nature loss is an economic and development issue that is very closely linked with climate change. Today's discussion looks at how we can better account for the value of nature and what nature and climate smart development really look like. I'm joined today by Mr. Alfred Okot Okidi. He's the Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda. Welcome. Mari Pangestu, World Bank Managing Director for Development Policy and Partnerships. Welcome, Mari. And Karen Kemper, World Bank Global Director for Environment, Natural Resources and the Blue Economy. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining. Karen, who's coming to us from Washington, D.C. today, will start with a presentation on recent analytical report work from the bank that makes the case for the economic and development value of investing in nature. Um, Karen, welcome, and over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, it gives me really great pleasure to welcome you all to the World Bank COP26 high-level MDB pavilion event, The Value of Nature for People and Planet. For the World Bank, the biodiversity and climate crises are critical development issues which are interlinked. 
unsustainable use and degradation of ecosystems affect their ability to act as carbon sinks, undermining climate change mitigation efforts. Climate change, in turn, further threatens the integrity and resilience of ecosystems and their key role in climate mitigation and adaptation. And failure to address both crises will give rise to real material and systemic risks. It's estimated that more than half of the world's domestic, uh, gross domestic product is generated in industries linked to nature and its services. So a combined approach that enables nature and climate smart development is needed. And let's go to the first slide, please. So to come to this approach, we need to make an economic case for nature. It requires data on natural capital as well as tools to integrate the cost of nature into policy making, and we need to mobilize finance for nature. So we have worked to contribute some of the analysis needed to weigh trade-offs and make sustainable and nature smart development decisions through a series of recent World Bank flagship reports. So the Changing Wealth of Nations 2021, where you just saw the video, produced the most comprehensive global estimates of wealth and natural capital, covering 146 countries from 1995 to 2018. This report fills an important data gap because, as you know, countries regularly track GDP as an indicator of their economic progress, but they don't track wealth. The assets, such as infrastructure, forests, minerals, and human capitals, that permit countries to produce the GDP in the first place. So changes in GDP measure whether growth is growing, but changes in wealth measure whether this growth is sustainable. So the Changing Wealth of Nations report produces these wealth estimates using an internationally accepted methodology that allows wealth estimates to be used by ministries of finance and other policymakers. Now, there are limitations to this methodology when considering the value of biodiversity and ecosystem services, and therefore our other flagship uh, publication, The Economic Case of Nature, estimated for the first time the economic cost of collapse in key ecosystem services. And our approach paper, Unlocking Nature Smart Development, which came out in 2021, outlines global responses that could unlock nature smart development. So let me tell you a bit in the next slide and the following slide what all of this means in practice. What are the results of these analyses? So when we look at our latest findings on, on this global wealth, we see that although total wealth increased everywhere, per capita total wealth, which is a better measure of sustainability, did not. If resources, especially natural resources, are depleted for short-term gains, countries may be on, un, on an unsustainable development path. And in fact, 26 countries across every income group experienced a decline or stagnation in per capita wealth. The countries most at risk include fragile contract, uh, conflict, resource-rich and low-income states. If the trend continues, then future generations in these countries will be worse off than present generations. Now, on the next slide, then, we can see that natural capital represented 6% of total global wealth in 1995 and in 2018, with a share equally divided between renewable and non-renewable natural capital. However, the importance of renewable natural capital varies greatly with income level. In particular, for low-income countries, renewable natural capital remains critically important, and it accounts for about a quarter of their total wealth in 2018. Nature has too often been invisible to na national finance. The Changing Wealth of Nations report sheds light on this issue by putting natural capital on balance sheets of countries. And this allows policymakers to proactively account for their assets now and make policies based on their wealth for, for the future. 
There are countries that are doing this already, as we will soon hear from the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Environment of Uganda. On the next slide, um, you see that um, our wealth accounting this time included for the first time mangroves and marine capture fishery, fisheries, which are a major component of blue natural capital. The findings are concerning. The value of blue natural capital fell by half from 1995 to 2018, as the value of capture fisheries collapsed by 83%. So overfishing, subsidies, and rising fishing costs have undermined marine catch fisheries wells. Meanwhile, the value of mangroves has risen 157%. And you may say, why has it done that? Well, mangroves are valued for their coastal protection services, which are increasing in value as coastlines are more developed and as climate change poses higher storm risks. So this indicates to us the great economic value that nature-based solutions can have. Um, the next slide shows you that there are limitations to our ability to value biodiversity using um, this wealth accounting method methodology for now, and how in fact we are addressing that in order to think through um, how we can really measure biodiversity through other analytical work at the World Bank. So earlier this year, we developed a first of its kind integrated global earth economy model to model the interaction between nature services and the global economy. We studied the impact of changes in selected ecosystem services on the global economy and vice versa between 2021 uh, and looking forward to 2030. These services are pollination, provision of timber and food from marine fisheries and carbon sequestration by forests. Net next slide, please. The analysis of that reveals that the world cannot afford the collapse of ecosystem services. Even a partial collapse would cost 2.3% of global GDP that makes it 2.7 uh, trillion US dollars in 2030. The negative growth impacts are highest for low income countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. And this does not even include the direct effects of climate change that run in parallel, making these figures a very, very conservative estimate of losses. Now, what policies can we put in place? The next slide um, shows our policy simulations, and it shows that there are already nature smart policies which can both reduce systemic risks and generate economic gains. Examples considered in our report include domestic and global forest carbon payments, shifting agricultural subsidy incentives, and increasing agricultural research and development. And we see that ambitious targets, including the 30 by 30 target, are within reach, particularly when synergies with climate change are exploited. And this will require an effective global and country level response, which builds on a whole of the economy approach that addresses the drivers of biodiversity and economy uh, and eco ecosystem loss across the economy, solid science and the economic base for action and measures to support an equitable and inclusive uh, transition. So once these building blocks are in place, nature smart development could be unlocked through six global response areas. You can see them on the right hand side of the slide. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see that it is both on the economic side, but also on the people side, working with uh, people and through communities, um, uh, and of course, mobilizing finance and leveraging partnerships. Mm, this in our report, it is uh, quite developed if you are interested to look, um, to look at that. And then coming to the final slide, um, what is needed going forward? And of course, one of the big discussions is about mobilizing finance and public uh, policy will only be truly effective if we can leverage the necessary resources to support nature smart development. In order to 
adequately scale nature and climate action to meet today's challenges, mobilizing finance is really key because delaying investments on nature and climate could actually trigger a vicious cycle where climate shocks and the collapse of ecosystem services impact economies further, making it impossible to address the consequences of climate change and nature loss that we are already experiencing. It's therefore necessary to create the adequate um, um, and affordable finance flow to developing countries, removing key apps obstacles that stand in the way on both the demand and on the supply side. And the private sector there has a really key uh, uh, role to play. To mobilize sufficient private finance, a two-pronged approach is necessary. One that finances green activities that promote and enhance the ecosystem services that nature provide, but also ones that greens finance and that greens financial markets. That will involve directing financial flows away from projects with negative impact on biodiversity on ecosystems, but it also means to incentivize achievement of sustainability objectives. For example, encouraging the adoption of green bonds, the further issuing of green bonds, and ensuring that the scoring of sovereign bonds ensures that the state of the environment and its economic value are taken into account. So with that, I want to thank you. It's been an honor uh, to share our work with you today. And now I'm looking forward to the discussion on how these important analyses can be put into action with our distinguished guests joining us in Glasgow. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Karen. Very interesting um, presentation there and, and some startling figures, including $2.7 trillion in potential losses to economies if we lose some of these incredibly important ecosystem services that nature provides. Um, let me turn to our guests, Mr. Okidi, who's the Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda. Um, I understand you've been working on, you know, understanding the value of nature to Uganda's economy and even factoring nature into your planning uh, and development planning. Can you just talk us through what Uganda has been doing and um, how nature, you know, how you're figuring nature more squarely in your economic planning. Thank you. Uganda's uh, development that is captured in Vision 2040 and the National Development Plan 3 is actually nature-led. And uh, we realize as a country that there's a big disconnect in terms of uh, understanding to what extent the natural capital of Uganda is actually contributing and driving the development of the country. And therefore, what we opted for uh, with support of the World Bank is actually to get into natural capital accounting. Because if you know what you're measuring, then you can manage it. Because the biggest concern for us as a country right now is the amount of degradation and the losses in some of the ecosystems. And yet when you look at uh, the basic figures like the foreign earnings, for example, tourism is actually, yeah, I think, the number two foreign exchange earner before the COVID pandemic came in. It was actually projected to be the number one. So it is very important for us as a country that these natural resources bases are actually understood and then we protect them. So it has led to now uh, at the development level, highest development level, the country adopting the national capital accounting. It has also driven uh, the government to come up with a decade of restoration which was launched just about uh, two months ago uh, after being passed by cabinet to see how we can restore all these ecosystems that are critical to ensure that future generations also benefit from these nature given, given, given resources. Uh, the reason why 
we want this natural capital accounting really in is because we need to understand and value because if we value it then we can treasure what roles it plays yeah Thank you. Um, I'll come back to this a little more in detail um, but first I want to turn to Mari Pangestu our managing director to explain, I mean, to, to talk about how the World Bank has been working on this for, for quite a long time. It's really been over 10 years that um, natural capital accounting has been a key priority for the World Bank and, and supporting countries like Uganda to do it. How do you see this work contributing to the broader mission of the bank um, on poverty reduction and promoting shared prosperity? Mari. Uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, for the question, Elizabeth. Uh, I think we, we can start by uh, where the permanent secretary left off. Mother, Mother Nature doesn't need us, but we need Mother Nature <laughs> uh, because it provides the ecosystem services that allows us to breathe, to eat, and to live. Uh, and the loss of nature, uh, na uh, nature and its uh, critical ecosystem services hurt the poor the most. That's why it's you know, a development imperative for us to address it. I mean, uh, Karen mentioned uh, some of the uh, numbers, uh, and it comes from the three uh, major reports that Karen mentioned, including the one that uh, we are talking about today, which is the changing wealth of nations. Just to add to Karen's numbers, three billion people depend on marine and coastal biodiversity for pro protein intake and livelihoods. 75% of food crops rely on animal pollination. And the poorest rural areas get income from forest resources, more so than uh, agriculture. And so they will suffer the most for, from the depletion of, of uh, forests. And the collapse of ecosystem services, uh, Karen mentioned the 2.7 trillion number. If you translate that into loss of GDP, it's 10% it's lower GDP for Sub-Saharan Africa and 7% loss of GDP uh, in South Asia by 2030. So uh, this is all uh, the, the loss of natural uh, uh, nature and ecosystem services also impacts on climate change, as Karen mentioned. And that will have a double uh, impact on poverty because uh, business as usual scenario is uh, leading us to an estimate of 130 million more people which will enter into extreme poverty. So we need to address and reverse the decline in natural capital. And to do so, as the permanent secre secretary mentioned, we need to put a value to nature. We need to measure uh, the value of uh, nature going beyond uh, GDP uh, and uh, provide the economic argument uh, for uh, protecting nature, conserving nature, uh, and restoring nature. Um, and it, this is key to internalize the value of nature in markets and government policy. Uh, so natural capital accounting uh, is one tool, uh, and the data and the analysis that's coming out of the changing wealth of nations is addressing this very important data, ga data gap uh, for policymakers uh, to help them guide uh, to have more uh, nature and climate smart policies that will, you know, I, I think it's very important to emphasize because we, we are making the economic case for development as to why you need to uh, uh, protect nature and ecosystem services and it's linked to climate. It's about conservation, it is about restoration in some instances, but it's also about the use of the nature, natural assets that you have in a sustainable way, right? It's not about just conservation because a lot of times uh, there is kind of a, a pushback because, oh, conservation, then, you know, wh where, where do the livelihoods go? But you can do all three, you know, conserve, conserve restore, and sustainable use uh, of the resources like tourism, as was mentioned by the permanent secretary. And, and it creates a lot of value if you can measure it and then you can manage it. It's a, it's a line we've heard before, but it's certainly true when it comes down to protecting what matters most. So um, thanks, Mari. Um, Mr. Akidi, you, you did mention there that, um, that, that nature is a key part of your tourism, what's attracting people to Uganda, and it's, it's therefore becoming a, a huge driver of economic growth in, in your country. Um, can you tell us more about some of the drivers of nature loss? I mean, you have a massive forest resource in Uganda. 
what ad what's driving this degradation and, and how is something like natural capital accounting that we've heard about today helping make a difference? Okay, they are primarily about uh, four drivers of uh, uh, degradation in Uganda. The first one is poverty. Uh, people go to look for livelihood and resources to survive uh, in this forest because of the poverty level. The second one is because of the rapid growth in population and the demand for agricultural land. Uh, and given that our agriculture is nature-based, you find that people are moving into the forests, the swamps, and even the slopes of the mountainous areas that are quite dangerous to do cultivation. So the drive is for agriculture. And then nearly 95% of the population of Uganda still depend on the energy sources for cooking on biomass. That is charcoal, firewood. Uh, so they venture, especially into the forest, to look for that energy for, for, for cooking. We have also witnessed uh, opportunities traders, especially from without Uganda, who have gone at, uh, after very exotic species and rare species, and they have been actually harvesting them, like the Afri uh, Abzalia africana and the shea nut uh, tree uh, with disastrous consequences. So, these are the four primary drivers of uh, degradation in Uganda. So in a way you have to attack multiple problems um, in a whole development plan, taking on all of these drivers at once. How do you, how do you go about doing that? Your, your new Vision 2040 is interesting from that point of view. Yes. The solution lies in actually addressing these drivers in an integrated and holistic way. And uh, one of the things that uh, Vision 2040 strives to is actually transform the country into middle income by 2040. Uh, and to do that, we need to move the agricultural practices from the peasantry type into commercial, which is smart. And therefore, it implies using uh, less or the same amount of land, but producing more. So the issue of technology comes into place, the issue of water storage, uh, so that people can cultivate the same piece of land maybe three or four times in a year and uh, end up earning six, or five, six to ten times what they're earning right now. So that is, that is one of the solutions. The other solution is to look at uh, shifting the energy uh, uh, usage from biomass. And in this regard, uh, it is a gradual transition looking at energy efficient solutions like the energy efficient cooking stoves, but also encouraging uh, people not to go to the natural uh, forests or the natural trees for biomass, but instead plant the fast maturing species that they can use because some of them within a period of one and a half to two and a half years, they're already ready. So that is the drive for now, as we transition into cleaner, uh, cleaner, cleaner, cleaner energy sources. On the other side, uh, enforcement is being strengthened and we are also coming up with more robust legal protection because some of the laws at the moment we realize actually do not give commensurate punishment if you compare with the value of uh, the resources that is being laid to waste. Because somebody destroys exotic species worth maybe 200 million shillings, but it pays a fine of just about 80,000 shillings. So there is a disconnect. So we want to address that. Uh, but the principle is let the population coexist with nature. So it is something like uh, the MDC really making sure that you don't ban people, but make them coexist peacefully and in a sustainable way. So it's this value on nature that we're talking about today that has a benefit for people, so it's bringing, bringing that value to that awareness. Um, Mari, 
given you know what we've heard here today on the importance of natural capital for development, how how is the bank, as a big institution working with countries, um, actually making a difference? And what are we actually doing um, to support this effort to put a value on natural capital? I think we are doing quite a lot uh, globally and at the country level. Uh, because we see, you know, uh, the, the, the critical link between nature, climate, uh, and development, uh, and we are we need to invest in both nature and climate. So globally, uh, we have the data and analytical work that uh, you know was uh, described and presented by Karin. You know, the, today uh, we talked about the Wealth of Nations report, but Karin also mentioned uh, other reports. But the data and analytics are are key to be able to guide policymakers so that they can make the informed decisions that will lead you to, I like the way a uh, permanent secretary put it, so that nature and people can coexist in a sustainable way. So you want both, right? You want the development, but you also want to protect uh, the, va the value of nature. Uh, and uh, at the national level, we are helping uh, governments to, uh, be, with the data and analytics uh, to calculate the trade-offs um, and, and figure out what types of policies you can achieve both. So once you identify the drivers uh, of uh, the natural resource depletion, uh, you can't just say, let's stop it. Uh, you need to find an alternative. That, you know, people's livelihoods are at stake, so you have to provide an alternative. Like in the case of uh, many of the forest fires, for instance, in Indonesia, it's traditional slash and burn agriculture. And if you're not providing them alternative ways to uh, do their agriculture in a sustainable way, they'll still continue to do it, right? So no matter how much enforcement you do. So you do, you do need to provide the kind of policies uh, in an integrated way uh, and provide the incentives as well as the disincentives like the enforcement and, and the fines that was just mentioned. So uh, I think we need to really um, link efficient management of natural capital uh, in a country uh, with uh, also the development outcomes. And in our uh, new climate change action plan, with a commitment for 35% of our climate, uh, of our financing going to climate action, we are including nature-based uh, uh, solutions uh, in, all, uh, in all aspects, terrestrial, coastal, marine, um, and mobilizing additional resources uh, for nature and climate building uh, on our long history of working on biodiversity. And uh, in particular for IDA 20, because we, we earlier we, we mentioned that uh, the, the, the decline in uh, natural capital and ecosystem services hit the poorest countries the most and hit the poorest in these countries uh, even more. So in the IDA 20 replenishment, we are very much focusing on the synergy between nature, climate, uh, and development. Uh, just a few examples in India, we're doing integrated coastal zone management, uh, restoring 19,500 hectares of mangroves and uh, investing in pollution uh, management. In the lower Me uh, Mekong region, which is the third largest uh, area for tropical forests, we are doing sustainable forest uh, to scale. Uh, and uh, another example, uh, uh, basically last year, uh, we did 116 million hectares of marine and coastal protected areas. 10 um, million hectares of terrestrial protected areas and over 300 protected habitats, uh, biological buffer zones and resources. So this is just examples of, of just uh, how much work uh, we, we can do and uh, that we should do. And you know, Karen and uh, Minister, uh, Permanent Secretary also mentioned, uh, you, you, to do that you need financing. <laughs> Right, so uh, how do we expand financing beyond uh, our uh, commitment uh, for 35% of, of our financing going for climate, including nature-based solution? I think uh, we, we were the first uh, institution actually to issue a global uh, green bond in 2008, catalyzing sustainable investment in capital markets. So I think uh, country sovereigns such as Uganda have the potential to issue green and blue bonds, uh, Sukuk, uh, green sukuk bonds, these are all uh, instruments that countries have actually uh, issued uh, to raise funds for this. And then there's the pu private partnership, public-private partnership with uh, blended finance solutions, where again, 
uh, conservation uh, with other nature-based activities that is about conservation, restoration, and livelihoods. You know, I, I think, I think that, uh, we, we need to, to keep our focus on that and help countries uh, develop such policies. Well, thank you. Um, you make the connection there between nature and climate, which is good because we are at a climate COP. Mr. Okidi, here in um, Glasgow, um, you know, how is what your country doing being noticed in terms of climate, um, the importance of keeping Uganda's forests intact to, to addressing climate change? Um, how is that connection being made? And then, and then the kind of, the, as, as Mari raised, the need for finance, uh, some of these innovative financing tools like green bonds interesting to Uganda potentially going forward. Thank you. Uh, we have signed on to stopping deforestation. And um, as a country, we are one of the signatories already. Uh, we are on the task force for f long term financing. We are actually one of the pioneers that are going to actually uh, pilot it uh, globally on behalf of uh, the LDCs, uh, but also on the side of uh, adaptive resilience. We are also one of the seven uh, LDCs that are actually uh, chosen and we have started the, the, the implementation of that so that what we do in terms of uh, adaptation and at the same time conserving the environment, we can share with colleagues in the least developing countries. So, we had quite a lot of uh, interaction, and a lot is happening. And uh, the proposal, the promise of 100 billion, I think, is welcome. And from the various fronts, we see uh, a lot of uh, uh, proposals coming in, and we wait for the implementation to make sure that the 100 billion comes on board. And uh, our emphasis is that it should go a lot more towards adaptation. Now, coming to financing. Uh, yes, uh, the talk in the past has been between uh, government to government to look for funding to address uh, climate change. But it is pretty obvious that uh, we need to look at solutions beyond the government or the, the regional blocks or even from the multinational development banks to address this problem. And uh, Coming up with blended financing, I think it's one which uh, I think Uganda has already done it with the World Bank because we have a project that I think uh, we've just launched and it is actually investment in, in forest and protected areas. And we have loan from the World Bank. We have grant that is coming from the GCF that has been blended and the quantum of the money has grown to the extent that we believe it is a kind of uh, arrangement that can help us address issues of climate change. The same with the private sector. Uh, in Uganda, we have already started and we have a, actually a framework where we are bringing on board the private sector. And they have made voluntary undertakings using their own resources. And uh, they are committed to every year for the next five years planting at least 75 million trees. And uh, two of uh, the breweries who anyway use the water resources from the swamps and the forests as the towers have come up and they're very active in this particular program and they're also involved in rest restoration of swamps and protection of some of the two rivers in the country, which is actually a very good development. What I note is that the gap between the public sector and the private sector on issues to do with climate change is too wide and it needs to be brought up so that the private sector understands why they need to get involved in this and why they need to commit resources because it is their sustainability that is at stake. Very interesting and, and a very big theme here in COP this week and probably into next week as well. How do we bring, get the policies right so that the investment flows? So. Um, all part of this same conversation around wealth accounting. Let me f bring this con to a conclusion with you, Mari, on um, 
the other COP that is important to us all as well, the, the UN Biodiversity COP um, coming, it was recently kicked off in Kunming, China, um, but that will be playing out during 2022. Um, what do you see as the connection between these two COPs, COP15 CBD and COP26 27 coming forward? They are uh, in intricately, intricately linked because uh, we ha they are interrelated crises. The biodiversity loss and the climate change uh, crisis are interrelated as, as we have been discussing. And as I was walking uh, to, uh, to have this session, I passed a sign which said on one side, nature is climate, and then on the other side, climate is nature. So it's two sides of the same coin. And uh, you know, climate change leads to ecosystem losses, and you need healthy, healthy ecosystem services uh, to play a role in uh, mitigation, adaptation, uh, and resilience. We need uh, fo uh, healthy forests, wetlands, oceans, grasslands to serve as carbon sinks uh, to mitigate. Um, and it is also a, a source of uh, economic value, as, as was just mentioned. You know, the, these uh, sinks, carbon sinks, there's a lot of talk about it here in this COP. How can you get carbon credit and offsets for that to be able to finance uh, that, that uh, effort? Uh, so I think climate change and uh, ecosystem services uh, protection is very key, again, because we know the impact if we don't do that, the impact on development and the poorest. If we just, if we didn't do anything, uh, business as usual scenario, it, it will really hurt the poor uh, the most. So we need transformative and coordinated actions on both natural uh, and ecosystem services losses and the climate crisis. We need to manage both crises uh, in an integrated and interrelated way. And in fact, uh, our estimate is showing that nature-based uh, solutions uh, can provide 37% uh, of cost-effective climate, climate mitigation uh, efforts till 2030. So that, that's quite a huge um, uh, proportion or contribution to climate mitigation. And, you know, uh, we, we've been mentioning mangroves, so let me give you an example from my own country, Indonesia. Uh, World Bank is helping Indonesia to do mangrove restoration. Uh, I think it's 600... Uh, uh, million hectares over the next uh, five years uh, and it has a triple benefit uh, because uh, it's part of the green fiscal stimulus program uh, of, of Indonesia right now so you create cash for work for, for the communities that live around there and benefit from, from that coastal area to do the restoration so they're getting cash for work as the economy hasn't picked up uh, and then once the restoration happens, they will uh, have improved livelihoods uh, from uh, the restored uh, mangrove and the coastal area that becomes more uh, healthy and so on. So you have a triple benefit uh, of uh, livelihoods, income, uh, and then the climate, uh, climate uh, benefit and the, uh, of course protecting the ecosystem services uh, benefit. And it's not just livelihood today, but livelihood in the future, right? So uh, I think that's really the value of, of, of nature capital that we, we really need to, to protect. Uh, so uh, uh, fi just to close on the financing gap that was mentioned, totally agree, it can't just come from public funding. Uh, the financing gap is $700 billion uh, per year on average till 2030. So we really need an integrated uh, nature and climate um, uh, approach. Uh, and a, a, a link between the biodiversity uh, framework that's going to emerge from Kunming post-2020 and the Paris Agreement. You know, this, this, is, this is the work for us ahead. Uh, and uh, with that and government policies and the value of uh, nature uh, being more uh, measured and managed and clearly monitored, I think you can draw in uh, private sector funding, uh, as we had just discussed. We really need all that uh, to come together in an integrated way, whole of economy approach, uh, and uh, really clearly measuring the value that you are trying to that you are protecting, uh, and monitor uh, the, the actions that go with uh, in protecting and uh, conserving and uh, 
uh, utilizing the value uh, of nature. Uh, and that's the only way that you'll be able to you know, draw in blended finance. I mean, the, the that was an interesting example with the brewery and the forest. Uh, I think we can find many examples where, uh, you know, the, where the private sector is actually benefiting uh, from the protection of uh, the, the nature. They, will, they can also come in uh, to co-invest, uh, not just government, in protecting the nature. I have a similar example in, uh, in Indonesia in, in an area which grows rubber and it's below the conservation, it's in a conservation forest area. So it's a sustainable rubber plantation, but uh, they pay for the buffer around uh, them uh, because it's in it, right below a, a conservation forest. And it's also the migration path for the wild animals. So uh, they, they protect uh, the buffer because you know, it's in their interest because they are doing the sustainable rubber plantation there. Uh, and it was a blended finance. It was funded by blended finance, no government involved <laughs> uh, uh, with uh, a bank that came in and uh, USAID came in with a guarantee uh, and impact investors uh, coming in uh, as well. So, you know, it's, it, it can be done, put it, it that way. Yeah. yeah, you just got to be able to structure it right. Yeah, that is the, the message. It can yeah. be done. We have the economic analysis that Karen has outlined. Yeah. It's clear there's a, there's a value that needs to be protected and, and built upon. Um, and there's a huge link to climate. So I think that's the, that's the sort of great summary of this conversation. I want to thank you all. Mr. Okidi from U Uganda, thank you for joining us. Mari Pangestu, our Managing Director at the World Bank. And Karen Kemper in Washington, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. That brings us to a conclusion. Thank you all for joining and um, a fantastic prelude to Nature Day tomorrow here at COP. Thanks.